Hey, y'all. Me, Unplug. The altar's call system is a system that the church com- came up with. And by using the word altar, we tend to honestly go back to the old system, uh, the old covenant, the old way, the old testament, and the system of the temple. The church today often borrow uh, temple customs in order to have their worship experience in today's temples and tabernacles and churches and synagogues and cathedrals and centers and churches and whatever you want to call your building. The altar call can be a good system if it was treated right. But the system was created by today's church. And because it was created by today's church, it's jacked up. Let's talk about it on Unplugged. Hey, everybody, this is uh, So Walter. Uh, this is another unplugged episode, and I'm going to talk about the bad system of altar calls. And trust me, it is pretty bad. Uh, I was um, I'm doing this because I was uh, asked a question a couple of days ago from a concerned person who was at church, and there was um, a woman who came to the altar per se, and we'll say that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, because she needed something and the women came up there and before you knew it, it was a bunch of noise and a lot of confusion. And the woman who I talked to uh, said she just felt, felt that it was so confusion, confusing that is. And um, she just left there with it, it was scratching her head, wondering what was all that and was this woman helped? The history of this altar call, now watch this. Let's go to the beginning. An altar is a structure, any structure upon which an offering, such as a sacrifice, are made for religious purposes, right? Now, take your mind and bring it back to the origins of things. It was usually a raised platform with a flat surface. Look at your churches today. Notice the raised platform. The raised platform is a a, a pulpit, what they may call it, and there's a podium on the pulpit, And it's raised so that the people who are sitting in the audience can see the person who's standing before them. What we did was we created a altar atmosphere. We called it an altar. Uh, There are over 400 references to altars in uh, the Bible. The word altar is first used in Genesis chapter 8 when Noah built an altar to the Lord after leaving the ark. So we first see it, even though Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices to the Lord and some believe that there was an altar that they did make. So we don't know where it originated, whether it was from Cain and Abel or was it from Noah. An altar also represents a, a place of consecration. Now these are the natural places to go for an altar. We'll talk about the spiritual in a minute. Before God gave his law to Moses, men made altars wherever they were out, uh, you know, of whatever material that they had, it just made an altar. An altar was often built to commemorate an encounter with God that had uh, a profound impact upon someone's life. For instance, Abraham built an altar, uh, Isaac did, and Jacob did, and David did, and Gideon did. They all built altars and worshipped after having a unique encounter with God. An altar usually represents a person's desire to consecrate himself fully to the Lord. This is what today's church is leading to. And God had worked in a person's life in such a way that the, uh, the person's desire to create something tangible to memor- memorialize the moment. We do things to memorialize that moment. We remember these dates and these anniversary dates and times and places. And you put a check or you put two lovers by a tree and they put a, a, a lover's a sign, a heart sign, and put their names there. That is a memorial place where we met. Or you, uh, some people, some uh, people who are married, uh, when they first get married, they go to a particular hotel or some kind of uh, honeymoon spot, and they remember the the hotel and the room. Years later, they go back to that hotel with the hopes to get that same room. It's a memorial. 
During times of visual rebellion and idolatry, the Lord's altar fell into despair. So the prophet Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal. Remember that on Mount Carmel. I repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. So Elijah rest restored uh, his, uh, the restoration of the altar was significant given the rampant paganism in that day. So that's another altar. Sometimes God himself commands a person to build an altar after he had delivered someone in a miraculous way. When God gave instructions for the tabernacle, he also gave details, instructions for the kind of altar the courtyard should contain in Exodus 27. Now, in the broader sense, which is the purpose why we're doing this show today, the broader sense, right? Something's flying on the table. All right. It's too late for them, them things. In the broader sense, an altar is merely a designated place where a person consecrates himself. Here we are. To someone or something. In many church buildings have altars for prayer, communi uh, for communion, and for weddings and other sacrifices uh, or sacred purposes. And some Christians create their own altars for personal worship. Uh, and, and some people have altars at home as a place that they go. Now, you are to do what Romans chapter 12 said for you to do. Um, and that is to present yourselves, not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice. And here where we are. Every human heart has an invisible altar where the war between the flesh and the spirit is raged. And when we surrender areas of our lives to the control of the Holy Spirit, we are in effect laying the area on the altar before God. I'm, I'm going to get that thing. I got it. <laughs> it can help to visualize Abraham's altar where he offered his son Isaac to the Lord in, in Genesis chapter 22 and 9. So what's happening today? You do not have altars at your churches. You have stairs. You have an elevated system, platform, and boards, maybe concrete depending on your church. After a man or woman preaches the gospel, then they call for an altar call and the people come down for what was originally supposed to be for salvation. But what the altar call has turned into is a place where if nobody in there come down for salvation and then the person got to ask you more questions and what more questions are those? All right. How many here need something from the Lord? How many in here uh, need a financial blessing? How many in here are sick? How many in here needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost? How many need a refilling? On and on and on, the altar call turns into the after set. That's what the altar call is today. It's the after set. You see, there's the party for those of you who were saved all your lives. There was the party. And when the party ended, which it kind of didn't, uh, the, the, some people went home because of the lateness of the hour. And then we had an after set and that after set, you stayed all night long. It's for those who can hang out a little longer. All right. That's what the altar call is. Now, is it effective? In many cases, it is not. And one reason why it is not because there is no follow up. It is something cultural that you do after every sermon. And let me tell you, in most cases, the same people, go up to that altar for the same request. I was a part of churches where whenever the preacher called for an altar call, the same people went up there for the same thing week after week after week, four years. And it's like a person who has enrolled into an institution of higher learning. They eventually will kick you out. You can't stay there forever. When are when you going to show pro progression? When are you going to show that you graduated? The church is the only place I know that does that, unless it is a place where you go to get a fix. Uh, some people just go to a hospital because they, they like sympathy or they, are, they, are, they, like to be, they like to be sick. And so when you ever ask them a question, how are you doing? They'll say, um, this is hurting, that's hurting. I had a bad day. It rained on my head. Or every time you ask that person that, this person is in a mental state who needs to be delivered from this, this depressed state that they're in. The altar call is a place uh, where people are coddled. 
It's a place where people are embarrassed, where things are spoken over the microphone in the in instead of the ears of the person. It's a place where people are blown on and pushed down. It's a place where, uh, because of the the uh, the setup, uh, that churches have been um, sued. Ask me how I know. I was in a church where the preacher pushed a really heavy set lady down on top of a man who was holding her up. He was an altar worker at the time. He wasn't trained in it, but there he was, and he was pushed, and he fell down and, and, and shattered his back. And lawsuits. It's sad. And unfortunately, the worst part about altar calls is false conversions. Many people go up there, unlike the Roach Motel. They check in, Roaches check in, but they don't check out. Uh, there are too many people who walk up to the altar call for salvific purposes, and then they'll, they'll do the sinner's prayer, they do whatever, you, 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 get, you make a, a, a public spec spectacle out of them, turn around six times, make them run around the building, take your shoes off and scream and all these things, and then, and then church is over. And this person go back to whatever they were. So no phone call, no text message, no no inbox message. No, let's take you somewhere. Just let, 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 no, not visiting the home. Nothing. And before you know it, it's a false conversion. Simon the sorcerer. The Bible says he believed until he didn't, because he wanted to pay for the miracles that the apostles were performing, and they had to rebuke him. Uh, Jesus even made the analogy of their people who heard the word of God and went outside and with, with vigor and excitement and the devil stole it from them. Uh, he talked about the, the sower and the, and the seed that fell on thorny ground and here and there. So this is what's happening. The altar call that this church has set up, the system of the church instead of the ecclesia. Uh, and the origins of it was that speci specifically that is the, the Baptist church. It was a time of discipleship. It was a time, the altar call was a time, and the, and the altar call is not that old. It's not hundreds of years old. I think the altar call actually came around in the 1800s, and it was a time when uh, you, when they gave you the what's called the right hand. You came and you gave the preacher your right hand and shook his hand. It wasn't about salvation, but it was about joining this noisy band. Physically, more so than spiritually, you become, it's, all, it's about membership more so than it was discipleship to, to Christ, all right? So it's a bad system. And most of you who are in churches, you've seen the system and how it has abused people, men and women, but mostly women. The altar call is mostly a woman thing. Uh, a man is typically doing the altar call, but the women are abused up there in many cases. And it's sad. Can the altar call go through a, a progression of um, a cleansing? Yes, it sure can. We can change the system. And some churches uh, are good at doing it by having the, the people come up to the so-called altar and taking them out of the church and having a uh, private time with them. Turn the cameras off. It is a very intimate, private moment with that church, and they should turn it off. And the reason why so many of us content creators get a material the way we do is because the altar call became a fiasco. It's a bad fiasco, and here we go. Uh, the Geno Genius was trying to cast the devil out of a man. It became a fiasco. T.D. Jakes was trying to cast the devil out of a woman. It became a fiasco. And it, we can't tell you how many times over and over and well, wanting to bind them. And, and so many people have t um, one reason why we got the, the brother Cartwell says, I'm not gay no more. I like women's, women's, women's. That was an altar call that went around the world. It was the most embarrassing moment in the Church of God in Christ history. The altar call. And I called the bishop and asked him why. No, he called me. <laughs> I wasn't going to call him. Uh, I called Bishop Brandon Porter. Sorry. He called me at midnight and, and uh, because I did a show on it and he tried to defend why he did what he did. And I said, you gave that man a hundred dollars to act the fool. And, and you had the cameras on and he 
try to explain why all these things were going on, and we're fine today, but it was a hot mess. The altar call is a public spectacle. So again, you do not have an altar. There is no altar at your church. There is no place there where you go and the and you provide uh, the fire. What's that song? I pro and I provide the sacrifice. All right. Well, I provide the sacrifice, but my sacrifice is a living sacrifice that I'm giving to God, and my altar was within me. Your church doesn't have an altar because an altar is a place where people die. Where not people die. Well, if you're a pagan, then yeah, if people did offer it. Uh, people and their babies to Moloch. Yes, that is an altar. Otherwise, uh, turtle doves and bulls and animals, what have you, was offered to God. So there must be a place uh, and there must be a, a sacrifice and there must be fire. All right. Well, that's not happening in none of your churches. And so we spiritualized it. I'll allow it. Um, so the altar can be a place where you in your car, you can be uh, outside, you can be by the a water fountain or you could be at the grocery store or you could be at home in your prayer closet and that is a place of uh, where you can memorialize a place where you could go to the Lord and offer yourself to him we have really really taken it to another level so if you want to uh, have a sermon and you want to uh, do a time of altar call you really need to uh, have a time with your group uh, and see how you all can do it in a safe manner. Uh, my church, and I didn't know they were going to do this tonight. At the time of this recording, it's a Friday night. And they are right now setting up to have a seminar on how to do altar work. All right. I won't be able to be there uh, because they just came up with this a couple of days ago. So it's really ironic that. They're doing this tonight, and I got that call the, a few days ago before my church called us. All right, so I'm praying uh, that they're going to have the right person to help them with this altar call in a safe manner. And if there's somebody up who's up there who needs help mentally, you may not be qualified to help these people. All right, all that screaming and shouting, and you don't brush your teeth, and you don't put no mouthwash in your mouth, and you just it's just a hot mess. You up there tearing for the for the Holy Ghost or what have you, and it's a mess. It's a mess, y'all. It's a mess. I may need to do a part two to this. All right. Some of these people need to go lay on the couch and talk to a licensed counselor. But you all can't handle all of, take care of all of these, especially if it's a mental health health case, because it's dangerous for the, what the church is doing to some of these people. It's dangerous. Even those who are need a medical attention, it's dangerous. Dangerous. Still pray for them. Lay, uh, uh, pour oil on them. Whatever you need to do. But you need to call the doctor, call the hospital, call the paramedic, call a, call a psychologist, something. All right? Let's do a part two. I see it's needed. I appreciate you all. Listen, if you agree or disagree, come sit on the couch with me. We'll be here. Take care. Unplugged. Unplugged.